Hey, welcome to Surrendered Image Video. Today we're here with my friend Greg Gay, who's also the co-founder of Surrendered Image and does so much of our technical work. Um, Greg, it's really nice to have you uh, here. Thanks, Carl. Yeah. We're just ready to roll here. <laughs> ready to rock and roll. All right. Yeah. That uh, seems to be your style these days, eh? <laughs> That's it. I'm yeah. Les Paul. Uh, so, you know what, Greg, I understand that you're quite a busy man, right? You're constantly uh, doing work on Surrendered Image with the... Uh, uh, the website there. Um, you're an incredible musician, and uh, I'm just wondering how how often do you get to do this whole interview thing? Well, I forgot to ask you first. How much was I paying you to say that? A lot, actually. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just wondering what uh, uh, what else do you do? I, I mean, I mean, are interviews the only thing you do? <laughs> well, I'm pretty busy right now with you know what? I have two daughters. Okay. And they're both getting married this summer. Wow. I'm glad I don't have three daughters or six daughters, because if I did, they would all get married this summer, too. So, <laughs> so right now is really a season of family uh, time and uh, new son-in-laws and all kinds of fun stuff happening. But um, And how do you feel towards your son-in-laws? Do you like them? Are they okay, guys? Well, this is, uh, you know, pretty public stuff, so I guess I better say something nice, but... You know, I don't even have to try to, though. They're really great guys. Are they they Actually, really are great guys, and man, they're a lot of fun, and looking forward to hanging out. I finally get some boys, you know. Oh, that's 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 actually kind of nice. I understand yeah, we're that. We're going to do cool things like watch lots of hockey. <laughs> well, you know, you'd think you were, you were Canadian with the, uh, yeah. <laughs> the line like that. <laughs> hey, you know what? Actually, speaking about your son-in-laws, uh, your future-to-be son-in-laws, which are coming up pretty shortly... I don't remember which one it was, but I remember one time you called me, and during this phone conversation, you said, oh, Kyle, it was the most awkward thing. Um, uh, he asked to date my daughter, or something like that, and I just wonder if you could share that story with us a little bit. It, it was pretty funny. Hmm. Oh, that must have been Nolan. Well, I knew it was imminent that he was going to ask me to date my daughter, mm -hmm. and, you know, he, he texted me one day when they, Melody and him were still going to high school, and... I get this message, hello, Mr. Gay, um, can I talk to you? And I'm going, okay, you know, here we go. And uh, so I go, yeah, yes, Nolan, like, what would you like? And he uh, says, you know, well, I want to talk to you about Melody. So anyway, he shows up at my office later that day, and he walks in, and you can tell he was just so nervous, right? Yeah. And uh, what he didn't know is I was really nervous, too. And... Uh, <laughs> So he comes in, you know, no, and what do you want to talk about? And and he says, well, Melody. And I said, is it Nolan? Are, are you nervous? Well, a little bit. And uh, I said, you know what? Uh, I'm really nervous too. And uh, from there on, it went really well. We had a lot of fun. And, uh, well, that's great. Yeah. Well, you know, and I think the... Uh, uh, the threat, the one you forgot to mention uh, about myself and some of your other friends that own shotguns, I think that was a pretty uh, convincing speech you gave to him as well, right? Yeah. <clears throat> well, what I did with Nolan and uh, with John, too, is uh, we had a, a, a funny little thing printed up about 10 rules of dating my daughter. Oh, uh, okay. And, you know, they were right down to Agent Orange, and I kind of overreact sometimes because of <laughs> shell shock. And uh, when I hear your car drive up, I'm, I think it's a helicopter and different things like that. And, uh, <laughs> they were really good sports. And Oh, that's and, good. Uh, that's good. good. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know what? I've actually had the... Uh, uh, I've actually been able to meet both of them, and they seem like really great guys. So uh, I'm happy for you. Looking forward to the wedding, and I'm looking forward to eating on your dime. So uh, yeah, yeah thanks, that's great. Man. Yeah, no problem. Uh -huh. So um, I, uh, I have to point out that uh, actually you, sir, are officially an American, although you live in Canada and you've lived here your whole life. We call you an honorary Canadian. Um, and Surrendered Image got its start in Canada. Uh, as you well know, our, our colleagues from America are American, all American good boys, right? And, yes, um, yes. yeah, so I'm just kind of curious to know, though, what are some of the most confusing uh, American stereotypes you've come across? Well, you know, I guess I lived in the United States until I was six or seven. <laughs> and uh, so there's some things, well, stereotypes, things I get mixed up on personally is like roof or roof. Things like that. I guess I would never say... Well, one's above you your know? head. The other one's a dog. 
Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Uh, garage or garage. You know? Gotcha, yeah. And uh, things like that. So I guess those are the things that, uh, but but I'm pretty much fully indoctrinated, uh, about 110% Canadian, really, and uh, all I can say is, where were you in 72? And if you don't know about that, you can't really claim to be a Canadian anyway, so let's just move on now. Just, <laughs> just, just for the record, um, I, I, in 72, I don't think my father was even an adult yet, so uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. he would have been about 14. There so, there yes, there yeah. Okay, um, so, uh, Greg, um, I, I wanted to ask you about, uh, about Surrendered Image a little bit. All right. This is uh, this is a ministry, and I know you're not into that term, but this is a ministry that you're a big part of. <laughs> and uh, I'm just wondering, um, how did that all come together for you? Well, you know, I got this friend named Kyle May that one day I yeah, I, if I, I get rid of woke him, woke up and found I was an admin on this Facebook page called Surrender Images. Kind of presumptuous of him, eh? Yeah, it was an interesting thing that happened, and I look and there's I'm going, what is this? And I'm thinking like, what's he doing now? And, uh, but, but just a short time before, you know, you had got a hold of me and said, you know, I remember you were, you were really down and you said, Greg, you know, is this church just about tithing and keeping all these rules and everything? I've never really seen anybody else and it's all of uh, uh, this kind of thing. And I said, no, Kyle, that's, you know, that's not it at all. And, and we had a good talk and, and that's kind of what led you to to start that Facebook page, and you know, nobody had any idea that what that was October, mm -hmm. um, 2013, and here we are at the end of April, 2014. Not very long after, but you know, uh, a lot of things have happened, and uh, we're working with some great guys, and uh, so yeah, what really, what really, uh, it was. I see the wondered image as really a, a modern day social network phenomenon, but it was obviously something that God had his hand in. I remember you saying that, you know, you really, really felt mm -hmm. that you needed to start that thing. I remember waking up that next morning to find out that I'm in men, and there's like 30 likes, and I go, hmm, that's interesting. And, and you said, you know, Greg, I, I don't even know most of these people. And it just sort of snowballed from there into this very, very international uh I don't like to use the word audience, but but mm -hmm. people that uh, are just kind of really uh, curious in what the message is. And, uh, There's a lot of people interested in, in, in grace, and it seems like they just um, have come from all uh, uh, all quarters of the earth to uh, to congregate on this this one site, and uh, it's quite uh, quite amazing, really. I mean, it, the page was originally set up to be. Uh, uh, a resource page because I had people contacting me to say, "Hey, what's this new theology you're all about? What's this? Mm -hmm. What's this new message?" Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, so I remember, as you said, to uh, I really felt like God laid it on my heart to do it, and I really felt like I was going, "Oh God, no! Uh, you know, who am I? Well, why, why would I ever do this? Right? I mean, and I just thought I could just in my head I could just picture uh, people uh, chuckling when they saw that I'd set this up." Um, and so, but I just felt, you know what, um, you, you, you do what you feel God tells you to do. So, mm -hmm. yeah, so there we're at. So, mm -hmm. well, that's great. That's great. Um, so I, I, I wanted to talk a little bit about your early life. Um, I recognize you, you grew up on a ranch, but things weren't always that easy for you. Um, uh, you, uh, I believe you, you, you had some form of uh, disease, Stickler's disease, I believe it was called. Now, could you tell us a little bit about that? Well, it's called Stickler syndrome, and uh, it's really not a hundred and ten percent sure diagnosis, but it's the expert's best guess at this. Like, there's never been a DNA exploration or whatever done, but but the bottom line is, it's uh, one of the ways it can affect you is with uh, eyesight and, and hearing, and that's kind of how it's uh, affected me for sure, and so. Um, at this point in time, I, I would have less than 10% uh, eyesight and 10% hearing. And, uh, but, yeah, things have been a challenge sometimes, but I've always looked at it from the point of view as, you know, 
you do, always do what you can with what you have. You know, you do the best you can with what we have. You know, here we, are, we do we do interviews with a couple of iPhones. You know, <laughs> I mean, you could say let's not do anything at all, right? And and wait the rest of your life for perfect conditions or whatever. And that's not how God works, and that really is part of understanding the heart of God too. Is that He uses very very imperfect people like a Kyle or a Greg. Or, or a Ralph or an Andy or a Jeremy or whoever, you know, and it's, 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 that's the exciting thing about it where there's no, um, you know, class structure or uh, all kinds of pressure sometimes that we made things to be in, in the kingdom of God. That's right. So... Despite the, the difficulties with your eyesight and your hearing, um, you went on to uh, become quite, quite the musician, actually. And I've had the, uh, the privilege to play with you several times. Um, could you tell us uh, a little bit about your, your musical background then? Well, when I was in about grade four um, in Canada, that's when you really start to get into music and we start to play the recorder, the little flute thing. And I would just sort of pick it up and play the songs. I mean, I wasn't a prodigy, but I could figure them out pretty fast. And because, you know, you're looking straight into uh, the music sheet, I <laughs> the thing sticking out. I couldn't get close enough to see the music, right? And so I would just figure it out and play it. And so uh, our music teacher, she said, you know, why don't you get your parents to get you a guitar or something? In the meantime, I played bongo drums and stuff like that, too. And... But anyway, when I got a guitar, I just fell in love with the thing, and uh, I would I would play for several hours every day. And uh, a friend of mine gave me an electric guitar. There's an article about that. Uh, the right. guitar that gently wept. Yeah, yeah. And that story has a fair bit of my musical story in it. And uh, but I went from there, and I always wanted to have a band. I thought I would call it Purple Sage, and, and that happened. And uh, But when I was 19, I, uh, yeah, that's when I really came to know the Lord. And I'd never heard of uh, Jesus before. And, uh, <clears throat> so, yeah, I started to uh, move away from, uh, I guess, the, the secular as we call it, music, and, and I really wanted to use my gift for God, and yeah, and then I played with amazing people like Kyle May and lots of other people, and yeah. Well, that's great. That's great. So, I understand uh, that you actually, um, you know, you you went to Bible college for a while, uh, then from that point you left, uh, and, and you actually wound up working for Prairie Bible Institute, you became a worship uh, pastor. Uh, actually uh, was a, the assistant pastor of a church from there and then kind of got into this uh, into, into this grace message or what uh, some circles like to call hyper grace um, and uh, I'm just wondering uh, now uh, you're writing a lot about church leadership and uh, uh, some of the things that you've seen there and I'm just wondering if you could talk to us about all that somewhat well I guess uh, from a lot of the time I went to Bible college on you know, around 1991, I always was <clears throat> involved in ministry <laughs> and uh, doing different things for the Lord. And uh, uh, I seemed to be, uh, wherever we went to church, and not always, but quite often, you know, the pastors would want to know what I was thinking. And there was times I came, became very good friends with uh, with some pastors and uh, things like that while I was going to Bible college. And, um, but when I got involved more with uh, the whole music situation as uh, more of a worship leader, interesting, I never could sing it, you know, everybody, including you, would take my mic away and say, Greg, please play a guitar. And I believe sing. I burnt yeah, it once. Play a guitar. Yeah. Shut yeah. up, right? Shut yeah. up, play a guitar. Well, I never said yeah. shut up. I, I just said, be quiet very nicely. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, um, for sure. But what what I began to see through the years, though, were when in, in, in different scenarios, 
over the last 20 years or 25 years was um, I saw instances in leadership where um, leaders would get highly, church leaders, would get highly offended of people that would God would bring across their paths that would have uh, different gifts is mm -hmm. what it would really turn out to be, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, maybe one guy would be uh, a really good teacher and somebody else would come in and uh, really be embraced that would have a different gift, maybe more like a shepherd or whatever, right? And, and so one of my passions has become over the years really is to, to be able to communicate to leaders that it's, it's really not all about us as leaders. Um, we have to be so careful of what we do and, and how we treat the people that we're working with and how we respond to them. Um, I think that what has happened by and large is really, it's not that much different from priest, pope, types mm -hmm. of things. When you read something like Flavius Josephus, you see right away the pattern that the religious leaders of, of, of the day they're back when uh, the high priest ruled the roost was they were either the most wicked or the most righteous guys in the land. And we still see the pattern today. But it doesn't have to be like that. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be like that. We'll always have those types of circumstances in our midst, but we've been taught from the ground up in, in ministry and in Bible college that as a pastor or whatever, that it's really an us and them mentality, right? Mm -hmm. And so when somebody comes in and offends me, what often happens is then I can just destroy them and show them the door. And what happens though is people get really, 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 really hurt that. Mm -hmm. really hurt that and that's a lot of what I really want to talk about and, and write about is I want desperately to see leaders be able to see that yes they need to be honored and all these things but it's not about homage mm -hmm. and that those things will be earned that kind of respect will be earned and people will love you and want to work with you because of their love. And so, yeah. Well, that's great. No, that's good. So, is there any, um, is there, is there any literature that you've read or any uh, books you've read that could uh, uh, help explain this further to people who are interested in uh, this line of thinking or about uh, the grace teaching in general? Well, you know, one of the books that really uh, really got me thinking in a whole different direction myself was Andrew Farley's God Without Religion. Mm -hmm. And really it is perfectly named. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of others out there that, that have a similar message. But to, to see that it's really, the, I, I really had a misunderstanding of the gospel and had come to, to, uh, to, to see that more from that religious point of view more through the eyes of, of, of a priest or kind of like how a pope thinks that you know uh, that kind of a thing I mean and, and, and the further I look back I see that when I initially came to know the Lord I didn't have any kind of that thinking mm -hmm. you know it was so simple and and that's really what we're talking about it's just getting back to the simple gospel of grace where it's not about earthly kingdoms mm -hmm. it's not about you know uh, titles mm -hmm. and assumed authority where I think I'm somebody and, and you're not therefore I can do whatever I want to do right mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and that would be called spiritual abuse so yeah, once again, well, those are the things we really, uh, I'm really passionate about that, and I really don't want to see people get hurt. And I, 
I want to try to make those things really clear in a way that people can grasp, especially leaders. So, mm -hmm. so a type of unnecessary thing just doesn't happen. Exactly. You know, there seems to be a bit of a movement going on uh, in North America, and I find it's actually happening more and more uh, south of the Canadian border uh, into the United States. Um, but it is touching Canada a bit too, and it's this it's this grace movement. Of course, lately it's been it, it has been labeled as hyper grace, right? And uh, that was actually more of a derogatory term um, that was that was created more by religious institutions. Um, however, I the grace people, including myself, have kind of embraced this term and said, okay, you know what? Let's take it on because everything about hyper grace defines who we are and what we believe. Um, so it's, it's almost like a bit of a second reformation uh, is, is taking place. Um, and I'm just kind of wondering, um, what, what's your pers from your perspective, like what do you think is actually stirring in the church today? Do you think that's an accurate portrayal? Well, you know, um, I do like Andrew Nelson's term that he, he coined, and I had thought about this before, but I think Andrew was the first one. To was it Andrew it. Nelson that came up with that? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. And, and I don't want to use that used, term yeah. at all. You know, he wrote an article called "The Rest of the Reformation." And okay. I had thought about that a lot of how what happened in Luther's time was a massive change, but there was still a lot of baggage that was brought through from mm -hmm. the Catholic Church, right? And there again, from that idea of an ultimate leader uh, in our midst, that the, the Pope kind of thinking, right? And when you think like that, I mean, it changes everything. And when you don't think like that, when you realize that we're peers, that we work together, mm -hmm. um, that changes everything too. It's a whole different mindset. So yes, I don't mind using that, that, the term uh, the rest of the Reformation at all. I think it's a wonderful thing. I don't see it as, you know, uh, like we're, we're waiting for God to do this wonderful thing. Mm -hmm. uh, it's already it's happening. Almost, it's, it's, happening. it's already yeah. taking place. Yeah. We're not waiting for yeah. anything. We're part of it. And, and they're going to call it something in church history. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, I'm always curious about. So do you, what, do you what, think... What it's a grace awakening? I don't mm -hmm. know. I mean, it's not grace. The gospel is about grace. Mm -hmm. uh, and you talk about hyper It's the real grace gospel. And, yeah. So we've talked about that before, right? Hyper grace, call it what you want, mm -hmm. but it's hyper love. Of course it's hyper grace. So, I'm curious. This whole grace movement that we see coming, um, especially that we're seeing sweeping across the states uh, and just touching Canada... Do you think this is something that our church as an institution uh, or the body of Christ is going to grasp onto today? Or do you think this is something that's going to be rebelled against and uh, uh, really, uh, really hit against? Well, I think it is all, all about the body of Christ. And I think that um, what we're seeing now really, I mean, it's certainly not anything new. What we're just seeing really is uh, a clear understanding of the gospel. And uh, with without the traditions of men attached, right? And that's why, uh, you know, what we see in one sense is some think are tragic, and that's a huge ex um, exodus from the traditional institutional church. Mm -hmm. But it's because people are seeing those traditions of men, which always aren't all bad in themselves. I don't mean that. I mean, we do all kinds of things that are tradition, and if we'll make our own, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's not the point, but it's the point of, 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 of clinging on to things um, for the sake of, of, of that religiosity that, you know, I have to do this thing this way or whatever. Exactly. Or, you know, I'm so concerned about what I eat or what I drink or... Um, Don't eat fish on Fridays rules, or meat yeah, on Fridays. The music I listen yeah. to, what worship music, it goes on and on and on and on and on and distracts us totally from the message. Exactly. And the unity that we can have in Christ, it brings us together. It's got nothing to do with it really at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, there will be people that will always hang on to, to religious traditions and, and whatever and any form that they can find because that's their security. And sometimes what's really sad is when it's all taken away, that's all they really have. Exactly. I have absolutely loved uh, hearing your thoughts and insights on the church and uh, hearing a bit about how you, uh, you grew up and how you've overcome um, uh, some of the, the, the disabilities you've faced in life. 
Um, and on a most serious note, um, I just have to ask you a couple of questions. Canadian Mounted Police or the Texas Rangers? Oh, I grew up playing in an RCMP shack. We uh, the first uh, one in Western Canada. Yeah? Okay, okay. <coughs> Obama or Harper? Oh man, that's a tough one. Well, I'll go with Harper. Might as well. Yeah. Uh, Canadian Idol or American Idol? Oh, no idols at all. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard it said that Canadians are as peaceful as hippies and Americans are as wild as the West once was. Could you please interpret what this means to you? You know, I think I would just go with wild hippies. Wild hippies. <laughs> That's great. All right. Two more. Are you ready for this? Yes. All right. If you were trapped in the wilderness, which deadly situation would you prefer? All right. An igloo, or a polar bear, or Ralph Harris and his book. Oh man, I'd go for an igloo and a polar bear any day. Yeah, me too. Yeah. All right, last one. <clears throat> last one. If you had to pick any currency in the world to use as, as a one world currency, which currency would you pick? And I'm talking, sorry, out of either American or Canadian. So well, not any currency in the world. I would go with nothing but tunies. I think tunies for everything. I think that's brilliant. Yeah. It's absolutely brilliant. Yeah. All right. All right. Well, thank you, Greg. But uh, but it's against the other Americans on our site. And really, it's not that I have anything against them or the fact they're American. I just kind of want to prove that uh, Canada Canada is unique in its own way. And you, Greg, you know, if you could leave people with one thought today, what would it be? You know, I think it's really important that before you decide to do a video that you make sure everything's charged up so you don't have to switch cameras and then run into all kinds of problems. You mean charged up as in you've taken your coffee? Yeah, as in we have 2 or 3% left and we're running run out of gas. Absolutely. <laughs> Not the first time we've run out of gas. Thanks for joining us. <laughs>